depths of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drop round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O oh Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Does love make you happy? There's a song about that, you know? 579, tis love that makes us happy. And the love of God truly brings happiness to the soul. A healing balm that nothing else can give. 579. <laughs> Tis love that makes us happy, tis love that smooths the way. It helps us mind, it makes us kind to others every day. God is love, we're his little children. God is love, we would be like him. Tis love that makes us happy, tis love that smooths the way. It helps us mind, it makes us kind to others every day. This world is full of sorrow, of sickness, death, and sin. With loving hearts we'll do our part and try some soul to win. God is love. We're his little children. God is love. We would be like him. Tis love that makes us happy. Tis love that smooths the way. It helps us mind. It kicks us kind to others every day. And when this life is over and we are called above, our song shall be eternally of Jesus and his love. God is love. We're his little children. God is love. We would be like him. Tis love that makes us happy, tis love that smooths the way. It helps us mind, it makes us kind to others every day. Thank you for singing with us. Um, if you'll bow your heads with me, we're going to invite God to be with us this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For the Sabbath day in Genesis chapter 2, it says that you blessed the seventh day and you sanctified it for that in it you had rested from all your work which you had created and made. We thank you for creating us and the wonderful bodies that you've given us to be able to heal and rejuvenate and refresh and be restored into your lovely image. 
We pray for your presence here this evening and throughout the Sabbath hours that each individual would receive the refreshment that they so need and the rest that only comes from you. Bless Barbara as she speaks and bless the special music that we get to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hi, how are you? So these kids here, about two weeks ago, went to VBS. Does everybody know what VBS is? Okay. So they, every day um, when they arrived and they, before they left, they would sing a theme song. And they, so they, we sang this song uh, five days and two times each day. But when we came back home, we couldn't get the song out of our heads. We kept singing. So when we were deciding what song to sing tonight, um, we couldn't think of any other. So they're going to sing this song. And they're also, they also learn um, a sign language. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So they're going to sing and do some sign language too. Ah, ah, ah. Now that is 
vocals and also our guitar. Tonight I'm going to do a presentation called Is Truth. And so many people the door coming here. We get many people coming serious illness and this person tells me to do this and this person tells me to do that and then that person tells me to do this and, and I want to get better and I'm trying this and this but then I discover that actually that's apparently can be a little bit dangerous. It's so confusing. It's so what is truth? Well, I go to, always to the Bible. The Bible has stood the test of centuries after centuries. Tell us what is truth. And in Genesis chapter 14, starting at I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's an often quoted verse. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No And in John chapter 14, he's talking to his disciples. He's going to soon leave them. But they don't want to believe that. I mean, he's only 33. <laughs> and they have great plans in their minds for Jesus. They think he's going to come as a king riding on a white horse. And those Roman armies are going to be scattered. So when he says to them, and he says this in the first part of John, chapter 40, a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you again and receive you unto myself. But th th that sort of goes up their heads because they're thinking, oh, where's he going to go? He's only 33. We've got great plans for him. And then down in John chapter 14, verse further down in the chapter, In you and with you, I will you comfortless. This went over their heads too because he's leaving? No, no, he can't, he can't. But these are words for his disciples and for his disciples today. He will not leave us comfortless. But I'll go back a little bit. He says, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, of truth. So the spirit of truth. Let me tell you a little bit more about the spirit of truth. And it's down in verse 26 where the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who will send in my name, he will teach you all and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever things I have spoken of. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be dismayed. Beautiful words. And I think those words came alive after Jesus had died and risen again. And they started to think of all these things. Okay, I turn this one off. I think I'm going in and out. One, two, three. Aha. Uh -huh. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he's, he said he will send a comforter, which is the spirit of truth. And that will give us wisdom to know what is truth. And I want to take you further in John to chapter 18, because this little dialogue also tells us another part of truth. It's in a sad part. 
Jesus has been taken. He's in, he's in the judgment hall. And Pilate comes into the judgment hall again. It's starting in verse 33. And he says to Jesus, are, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, do you say this thong thing of yourself or have others told this unto you of me? Now look at the irritation in Pilate's voice. You see, it's early in the morning and he is the leader. And of the day, they would eat huge sumptuous meals at night. There would be a lot of wine. So he probably went to bed late and they have woken him early and he's not happy. So when Jesus said to him, uh, do you say this thing of yourself or have others told it to you of me? He says, am I a Jew? Your, your own nation and chief priests have sent you unto me? What have you done? What had he done? Pilate knew what he'd done. Pilate heard the stories. You heard, well, in Australia we say the bush telegraph. <laughs> it's almost faster than the internet, is that right? <laughs> he'd heard what he'd done. He'd heard the stories of the blind seeing, the lame walking. He'd heard the stories. And here the, the chief priest of the nation had delivered him and here he was in poor man's clothes. He was already a little bit bloodied where they'd knocked him around. He said, what have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, he said, then would my servants fight to free me from the Jews. But my kingdom is not now. It's not now from hence or not now from here. What did he mean by that? It used to be he created the world. The creator of the universe was standing in front of him. He created the world. So it used to be, and it will be again. Oh, we look forward to that day. But he said, not now from hence. And then Pilate said, art thou a king then? Notice the change. No more annoyed, no more irritated, because this man had the bearing of a king. Though he was in poor man's clothes, he had the bearing of a king. And there was a battle going on in Pilate's mind. What was the battle? Look at this man. <laughs> He'd never seen a man like this brought to him before. Usually when they were brought to him, they were swearing and cursing and angry. He was the man of the bearing of a king who had just acknowledged what? He was a king. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight to free me? No, it's not now from hence. So Pilate says, art thou a king then? Jesus said, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born. For this cause came I into the world, that I might bear witness of the truth. I love these little glimpses that we're given. Pilate was given a glimpse not many people were given. Because the saviour of the world was standing in front of him and he was working to save Pilate. <laughs> he was pleading with Pilate. He was showing him things. But, oh, there was a battle in Pilate. He knew he was innocent. He knew he was a king. Art thou a king then? Thou sayest that I am. To this end I was born. How many people were told that? To this, for this cause came I into the world, that I might bear witness to the truth. Was he bearing witness to the truth? Absolutely. Every look, every stance, everything he did. Pilate was convicted, cut to the heart. And the battle was, he was a ruler. If he freed this man, he heard the crowds. He heard the Jews. They, were, they had power, these Jews. They had influence. 
He knew that if he freed Jesus, his, his career would be gone. Could he free him? Wasn't Jesus fulfilling prophecy? He could have. He could have. Yes, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, and if Pilate had freed him, someone else would have taken him down. But Pilate's hands would have been clean. And the battle was fierce in, in Pilate's mind. And I think we all know the battle. We all know it. The cost. Could he afford the cost to lose everything? And then Jesus said something that tipped the scales for him. When Jesus said, for this cause came I into the world, that I might bear witness of the truth. To this end I was born, to be a king. And then he said, and every one that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate knew he was not of the truth. He knew that his life was nowhere near what it should be. And Pilate said, what is truth? And when he said, what is truth, he turned away. It wasn't a question. What is truth? And he turned away and went back out to the Jews and said, I find no fault in him at all. His words said that, but he didn't free him. <laughs> but those words of Pilate, aren't they the words of so many today? What is truth? How do we determine what is truth? I've just shown you that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Jesus said, the comforter, the spirit of truth that I will send to convict us of what is truth. I'd like to suggest that that spirit of truth was was was. Speaking to Pilate then, you, you, know he's, you, you know this man is different. He's got the bearing of a king. He's done nothing wrong. No wonder he said, what have you done? <laughs> How do we determine truth? There's a system. The Bible tells us what is truth. I call it the BHSC method, history tells us what is truth. Science can also determine truth. And then right at the end, in the BHSC, we've got common sense. And common sense isn't very common today. So I'd like to show you two systems that have been working against each other as long as history has been. One of them is based on truth and the other one is based on lies. But because most people would shy away from straight lies, there's something even more effective that's used. It's called deception. What's deception? Not as it seems. It appears okay. This system is built on faith. It's built on faith in God, faith in the great God of heaven who created an incredible body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. So it is able to heal when it's given the right conditions. So what's the, what's the other system? It's a system that is based on fear. It's a system that says we were not created, we evolved. And because we, we evolved, uh, we cannot heal. And because we cannot heal, we have to give a drug to stimulate the healing process. And every drug, no matter what it is, has a side effect. The fact is drugs never cure. They just change the form and location of. 
They're two systems. And I'm reading a book at the moment called The Story of Our Health Message. A lady gave it to me when I was in um, Sacramento recently. And it's fascinating. I love history. In the mid-1800s, the drugs then were pretty nasty. They had a lot of mercury in them. Um, they had a lot of nasty drugs in them. And George Washington was dying and they bled him and then they bled him and they bled him because they believed if you bleed someone, it, it would help them. And he was given more drugs. He, he died in misery. So there was an awareness of several doctors who had looked at what's happening with the drugs of the day and they said there must be something better. And so they started to use natural treatments. And what you'll find is common in the natural treatments are some basics. And it always fascinates me that Florence Nightingale, mid-1800s, she used these basic laws, sunshine. In fact, she said that the patient should never be out of the sunshine. She's 1854. Use of water. Dr. Jackson of New York, he had a clinic. And that clinic, I think they called it our home. And it had a board of doctors. It had about five doctors on the board and they had people come that had illness. And he said, we have the patients, we put them in the sunshine. We give them pure water. We make sure they go to bed early every night. And he called these laws of life. Florence Nightingale called them laws of nursing. And in the early 1900s, Dr. William Bates, in his book, uh, Better Ice Out Without Glasses, he uses them for eye health. Right in the centre, we've got trust in God. Faith in this incredible system that God created our bodies to be able to heal themselves. So there are some things that must stop. And these doctors recognised that these drugs weren't healing people. They were making them sicker and sicker and sicker. And that's what caused them to begin to investigate natural methods of healing. Fresh air. Inhaling through the part of the body that God created to breathe Nose and nose only, in and out. Nutrition, a simple diet, a plant-based diet. Fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. They contain everything the body he needs. Moderation. Even though those foods are excellent foods, they need to be done in moderation. Sunshine's important, but if you overdo it, you will burn. I haven't met anyone who drinks too much water yet. Many people don't get enough sleep. It's moderation. Exercise, called the forgotten remedy. Well, then, when Ellen White first received messages from God in 1863, so we see about the same time Florence Nightingale was, was getting impressions on keeping the laws of nursing, Ellen White was also getting impressions from God on these laws of health. She was actually shocked because at that time, doctors were telling people with lung problems to start smoking cigarettes. And people ate a lot of meat. So she was very surprised at these messages from God about natural health. And about that time, a paper came onto her desk that said, Laws of Life. And she opened this paper and she started to read it and it was everything that God had just told her and it was written by Dr. Jackson of New York. She closed the paper quickly, put it aside because she wanted to quickly write down everything that God had impressed her because she didn't want it to be taken from someone else. And then her and her husband eventually went to 
our home, which was the name of the health retreat, nice name for a health retreat, come into our home. <laughs> and they were doing everything that she'd heard. And the Dr. Jackson said, we have not, he said, I have not used a drug in 20 years of medical practice. He said, what we use is we use sunshine. He said, we, we do simple water treatments. We get the people to go to bed early. We share with them the love of God. We don't give them anything that can harm the body. He said, there is no drug in our health centre. He said, we teach them how to breathe slow and deep and through their nose. We show them simple foods, fruits and vegetables, nuts and grains, legumes. We show them how to be moderate. He said, most of the time, our patients only have two meals a day. Isn't this incredible? Do you know science is just discovering this? It's called time-restricted eating. We'll put it under here. Time-restricted eating. What's this plan? Eat all day? Is that right? And as we looked at on Tuesday night, stomach doesn't like it when you eat all day. You see, there's a great deception out there that as long as you eat, as long as you're drinking tea and coffee and soda water, you're getting hydrated. Is that right? But... But the science, show, the science shows us not so. Sorry, I had to move my BHSC method, Bible, history, science, and common sense. You can put any subject by these, Bible, history, science, and common sense, and you can determine what is truth. So what's happening today? What's happening today? Some will say, oh, the drugs are different today. Oh, they're not as dangerous as they were back then. Every single drug has a side effect. I mentioned the other day, it was in class about a lady I was asked to go and help at a conference. She was having a panic attack. I held onto her arms. I got her to breathe slowly and deeply in through her nose. She calmed down. I gave her some Pepmidol. She calmed right down. Within a few minutes, she calmed right down. I said, what? Um, she usually gets an asthma attack when she gets a panic attack, but she would calmed right down. I said to her, what do you usually do? And she went into a pocket and she got some tablets out. And I looked at the tablets. I got my iPad and I Googled went to Safari, put the drug up, and I started to read to her the side effects of her asthma drug. She said, I've got all that. But she didn't know what else to do. You see, something else is happening in this area here. It's a blindness. A blindness that people don't see. And I know when I worked as a psychiatric nurse, it wasn't until I left nursing, started to have children and wanted to give them natural medicine, my eyes were opened. I believe that back when I was in the system, I had this blindness. <laughs> but I didn't see people get better. And you talk to any nurse... <laughs> The drugs can save a life in a crisis, absolutely. But when the crisis is passed, um, there's no need to be on the drug anymore because the crisis is passed. What you can start to do now is work with this incredible body that was created to heal. And it will heal when you give it the right conditions. But there is another system that's based on deception and it's based on lies. And tomorrow morning I'm going to show you the part of our brain where we make our decisions. And it's the same part of our brain where reason, intellect and judgment is. And we need to make every decision on reason, intellect and judgment because God said, I have not given you the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, I have not given you the spirit of fear but of power 
of love and a sound mind. You know what a sound mind does? It has a look. It weighs up the pros and cons. It has a very good look at all the information presented and then makes a decision. And the amount of people that have come to me and said, if only I'd had time to think. But you've just had the news. It's shocking news. Maybe it's cancer. And then quickly you're told, quick, we can get you in tomorrow. Yeah, sure, sure. You're in shock. So it's very hard, it's very hard at that point. That's why I say to people, say, thank you for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider it because this illness didn't happen overnight. Florence Nightingale says, disease is often days, weeks, months, years in the making. So you've got time to make a decision. The amount of people have said to me, if only I'd had time to think. What God wants us to do is to weigh up everything and then we make a decision. And part of looking that is looking at Bible, looking at history, looking at science, and then we're left with common sense. So I'm going to touch on a few hot subjects. One is coconut oil. What are we told about coconut oil? Bad. Saturated fat, it'll give you heart disease. Okay, let's go to Bible. Does the Bible talk about coconut oil? No, it doesn't. Why not? Because coconuts weren't grown where the Bible was written. But it does talk about another oil, I think we all know that oil, and that's olive oil. And there are some lovely illustrations of olive oil. There's the story my children used to love about the about Elijah and the time of no rain and going to the widow who would feed him through the time of no rain. And when he saw her, he said, bake me a cape, woman. And, and the widow said, I'm about to bake my last cake. I've got a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. She said, then my boy and I, we die. And he said, God has said that in the time of no rain, he will provide. So she did took faith, <laughs> and every morning when she went to her barrel, there was a little bit of flour there. And when she went to her cruise, there was a little bit of oil in there. Who put the oil in there? God, it was a miracle. What has God just told us about oil? It is good. It is good. And I think it was yesterday we looked at the molecular structure of all the different oils and we had a look at how the body uses them in many different ways. We looked at 50% of the membrane around every cell is made up of fat. Except for the brain cell, 70% fat. So science tells us we need a bit of oil. History tells us. How does history tell us? Did you know that heart disease was very rare in about 1910, 1920? Very rare. And then they started to come up with uh, processed oils. They, you see, before processed oils came along, the oils people ate, depended where you live. If you lived in the South Pacific Islands, it was always coconut oil. If you lived in the Mediterranean, it was olive oil. If you lived um, in the northern countries, it might be a bit of olive oil, but it might be um, the butter from cows. Depending where you lived, if you lived way up the top, it was uh, uh, seal blubber, <laughs> fish, fish oils, depending where you live. So traditional, people have been eating oils for centuries. But in about the 1920s, high heat equipment was, was able to extract oil from hard seed. It was able to extract oils from the grape seed. It was able to, to extract oil. It was able to also um, squeeze up the corn. I don't know. You cook, oil, you cook corn, there's no oil on the top, is there? But they had a lot of waste from this corn, so they squeezed it up and got a bit of oil out of that. And Crisco, that's an American one, yeah. See, the, these... 
And you know what started when all these processed, damaged oils appeared? Heart disease. And heart disease also appeared as people started to use chemicals. We looked the other day at heart disease and we showed how it's damaged to the arterial walls that demands the liver to send cholesterol to plug up the holes. Cholesterol's just doing its job, it's just a Band-Aid. That's the damage to the arterial walls and these damaged oils do that. Now before that, heart disease was almost not known, but it's the number one killer today. So the Bible tells us oil is good. History tells us oil is good when we look back 100 years ago, before the refining of oils, we looked at the science, how our body needs oil and the, and the amazing effect of coconut oil. Do you know it's broken down in the mouth? Did you know that your body burns it as fuel because it can give so much more energy, whereas all the other oils are more stored? So let, we've just looked at Bible, we've just looked at history, we've just looked at science, and by the way, the South Pacific Islanders in, enjoyed incredible health when they were eating coconut every day. So what does common sense now declare? The coconut's not a danger. In fact, it would do us well to eat like the islanders traditionally ate, but we're not going to because the coconuts aren't growing around here. Go and have a look back at how people ate before this processed food came along. It's the processed food, the chemicals. That's what's made the difference. So history, history tells us that. There's so much sickness in the world today, and there is a reason for that. God's plan, God's plan is that we give the body the right conditions because our body was created to be able to heal. And if there's any sickness, then we can use herbs. In Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. They're there to serve you. They come in and they say, what would you like me to do? We looked at cayenne pepper, how if there's bleeding in the body, it'll seal the bleeding vessels. But at the same time, it can open the arterial walls and get the blood going much freer through the body. But isn't that a contradiction? Not when you realise that God made herbs for the service of man. They're there to serve you. So even though God says, I did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind, there are things today that can challenge us. And faith, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So if any part of the body is not well... Sometimes people get fear, and, and fear is a terrible reason to do something. Isn't that right? And sometimes when people make decisions on fear, they become to a place where they're actually, how did I get here? I actually don't want to do what they're wanting me to do. How can I get out of here? It's like the, the couple that rang me up and they said, Barbara, our little girl, her hand was just caught in the door and she pulled her hand out and left the tip of her finger there. She's the youngest of six children. They lived up in the mountains. They said they went to the doctor and he said, it's dirty, we can't sew it back on. You will have to go to a major hospital down in the town because they were up in the mountains and she will have to be fully vaccinated to be able to do this. She's going to have to take antibiotics. They're going to have to take a skin graft from behind her ear and sew it on the top of her finger. And as they're going down the mountain, they're starting to consider. They're using their reason, intellect and judgment. And they knew of this lady who lived in a rainforest and raised her, her six children without drugs. So they gave me a ring. They said, what would you do? That was a good question. <laughs> what would you do? I said, <clears throat> I wouldn't go to the hospital. I said, I believe, I have faith 
in this incredible body that God created to heal. I said there is a herb. There's two herbs that have growth stimulants. One is aloe vera and one is comfrey. I said if I were you, when I would get down to the town, I would go to a plant nursery and buy an aloe vera plant. <laughs> Open that aloe vera plant and put the gel on and bind that finger up. In fact, if you keep the skin on, it'll keep it moist. If you keep that finger moist, that will grow. How could I say that? Well, I met a lady who told me that her husband's grew. You just have to keep it moist and put those herbs on. And this is just a little girl. She's a two-year-old girl. They said that the hospital rang them and said, where are you? One has to be careful what they say because if they think you're doing wrong by your child, they have the authority to take it away. You have to realise there's a certain blindness there. They don't know about natural remedies. They say, well, what will we say? Just say you're getting another opinion. Don't, don't use the word al alternate. <laughs> don't use that word. <laughs> We're getting another opinion. So they went, they uh, bound up the little girl's finger. When it was bound up, it didn't hurt her so much. I said, I'm going to run down the paddock right now. You call it a field, yeah, we call it a paddock. I'm going to dig up the comfrey because it was winter. And in the winter, the healing properties of the comfrey go into the root. In the spring and summer, it's in the leaf. Because in the winter, the top dies off. So I ran down to the paddock, dug up some comfrey, washed it, put it in an express post and expressed a post it to them in their mountain. See, I'm probably 20 hours away from them. I'm middle of Australia and they're down the bottom of Australia. I said, what you can do is grate up that, grate up the, the root. It goes almost like chewy, chewing gum. And you can put that on the top or put aloe vera on the top, but keep it moist. So the father would dress it once a day. The mother couldn't be in the room. <laughs> that upset her so much because the little girl, of course, was not happy when that was being dressed. So they put the aloe vera on. He said he put the aloe vera on until it started to have a skin and then he put the comfrey on it. Within eight weeks, she had her fingerprint back. And if you look at her fingers today, you can hardly tell the difference. It did grow. <laughs> the human body will heal itself if, if you give it the right conditions. And many people do not know those conditions. But the same healing power that heals the cut that I'm sure we've all had from time to time, that same healing power is all through the human body. And there is one thing alone that all the experts agreed on in 2020 and 2021, and that is that your best defense is a strong immune system. Is that right? So what boosts the immune system? I was took my son to the doctor when he was six because he got a, th a fish hook in his thumb. How are we going to get a fish hook out of the thumb? Because it's got a barb on it. And so I took him to the doctor. And the doctor put some local anesthetic in it, did a little cut and pulled it out, then bound it up. And as we're walking out the door, he said, is your son up to date in his vaccinations? <clears throat> da -da -da -da. This is... Where's Clayton on the piano? Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Do you know, it's very important what you say. It's very important. <clears throat> I look back and I smile. Do you know what a smile says? I'm confident. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I said to him, William has been immunised naturally. I'm a nurse. I know what to look for. If I'm concerned, I'll give you a call. Thank you. Take his hand and move out very quickly. <clears throat> Be
because there's a whole waiting room out there. What do I mean by William has been immunised naturally? We live in the hills, he gets sunshine every day. Do you know that the sunshine boosts your immune system? Just the touching of it on the skin. And when the ultraviolet rays from the sun hit the skin, they convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. And vitamin D is an essential component in the building of our immune system. Did you hear what's converted to vitamin D? Cholesterol. It's a very important lipid in the human body. I'm sorry, but we've been spun a lie. It's a great deception. And as the book says, it's called The Great Cholesterol Myth. I've got another book called The Great Cholesterol Deception. I've got another book called The Great Cholesterol Lie. Another one called The Great Cholesterol Hoax. We're running out of words. Hmm? It's a deception. William goes to bed early every night. He drinks lots of water. He's been taught to trust in God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. That finger's not healed yet. It requires faith. <laughs> and hasn't God given, given us a lot of evidences <laughs> that our body can heal? I didn't give William any refined sugar. He had no caffeine. He had no meat. He had no drugs. He inhaled deeply through his nose. He wasn't having any mucus-forming foods. Thank you very much. <clears throat> he wasn't having any mucus-forming foods, so he could breathe easily through his nose. How many people can't breathe through their nose because they're all clogged up? Do you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to ask why. He wants us to investigate at every step. So when I was consulting with a man in Melbourne a few years ago, I said, what, works, what sort of work do you do? He said, I'm a private investigator. I said, so am I. We should all be private investigators. We ate a lot of food out of the garden. I fed the soil well. So he was getting high peak nutrition. He did not overeat. We didn't do things in excess. He ran around the hills all the day. He was immunized naturally. One lady said to me, I haven't vaccinated my child, but she said, I'm worried. What, uh, what, what will I do to prevent him getting sick? Here it is. This will sustain me. Psalm 55 verse 22, the Bible says, Cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. What a beautiful verse about how God will sustain us, but we must do our part. And it requires faith. It re requires faith in the great God of heaven who is able. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. One month before I left home, March, I get a call from Gracie's father. Grace is the one that lost her finger in the door. Grace is 17 now. Actually, she's 16. I get a call from her father. <clears throat> Grace has had an accident. She, she was riding a motorbike just with flip-flops on. It tipped over. She pulled her foot out, and as she did, the chain wrapped around it, and the top of her first three toes has been taken off. Whew, this is a bit bigger than a fingertip. It's a lot bigger than a fingertip. <laughs> Can you come? It's an hour and a half from where I live, up in Misty Mountain. I said, okay. Her father used to work with search and rescue, so he's used to <clears throat> dealing with things like that. When I came in, her foot was all bound. 
I went over to her father. I said, how's it going? He says, a bit rough, but we're getting there. And then he opened a little plastic bag with this sort of little lump in there. I said, what's that? He said, the top of her middle toe. It was about half an inch. It was taken off at the knuckle. I said, oh. He said, we've decided to do it here. I said, oh. <laughs> Whew, this is going to take a lot of this. <laughs> Oof. He said, Gracie's never been vaccinated and we fear that if we go to hospital, she's a minor, we fear that they may take over. He said, so we're pretty confident we can do it, but he said, we need your advice. <laughs> I said, well, let's have a look. <clears throat> cool. I'm a nurse, so it didn't bother me. But it was pretty badly lacerated, as you can imagine. The, 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 the most of the back of her big toe had gone. The whole top, half the nail. Well, I won't go into any detail. You can just imagine. And so what he did was he got aloe vera with the skin intact and um, he put this either side, one side of the toe and then the other side of the toe and on the top we mushed up comfrey. Comfrey's got the growth stimulant in it too. Packed it on top, bound it and then uh, put a bandage on it and then put... Uh, cling wrap all around it to keep it moist. Remember, you keep it moist, it can grow. And she's got big brothers. They're built like this. So we had, and she had a, she did not ever want to look at it. <laughs> she had it brought up there. And, and that was the hardest time. So it was 10 out of 10 changing that dressing, 10 out of 10. So we're nearly there, Gracie. We're nearly there. Okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, her brothers are squeezing her thigh and squeezing her, her legs. And uh, we bound it. We bound it. I said, what is it now? She said, six out of ten. And what she did for pain was two capsules of cayenne pepper three times a day. It has an analgesic effect. And that brought her pain levels. Pain People usually can usually bear pain four, five out of ten, yeah? And when I walked out about half an hour later, her pain levels were 4 out of 10. That's impressive. This is only 24 hours since it happened. Well, I couldn't go there every day, but they said after a while they were able to pour hydrogen peroxide on it and that cleaned it up. Then they sent me a photo. They said the top of one of the toes is, looks like a little bit black. Can you please come? Please come and have a look. <laughs> so I went the big trip down there. This is three hours for me to go down there and back. And I went down there and I had a look and I said, looks okay to me because the flesh was pink, it was lovely and pink. I did the aloe on it again and I said, it, it'll be fine. And, uh, and the whole time, whenever we put the poultices on, we prayed and we would not change it for 24 hours. And again, she's using the uh, cane pepper. See, this is big. <laughs> this is huge. This is major. But because of what happened to the finger when she was two, she's now 16. And it's um <clears throat> so they had confidence we could do it because they looked at they looked at, well, what happens if we go to hospital? And we had a friend that said he mangled up his finger. He said, I've I've already had six operations on it. Yeah. So you see how you're weighing up the pros and cons. <laughs> The toe has grown. Isn't that incredible? Now, so here we are. This happened, uh, must have been early April. So when it happened, the big toe was like that. And you must say even like this because the back had all been cut off. Her middle toe is way down here because it's lost. You know, middle toe is usually up here. And then that toe was about there. Today, this is all grown. Her toe is like yours and mine. So the back has grown right out. Now, I don't know, you know, usually this toe's up here. This toe's come up to here. So it's just incredible, the healing that happened. And I don't think they would have had the confidence if she hadn't lost her little finger way back then. This is big. 
And even though the father had had a lot of experience, they were desperately wanting me to go and have a look, and I, I appreciate and understand that. And at one point, the three toes started to grow together. That shows you the healing power of these. <laughs> I said, so we quickly separated them. <laughs> so he said we started to dress them, dress them separately. So there are so the two herbs that contain the growth stimulant is aloe vera. And one way you can tell this is that if you cut an aloe vera plant, let's say you cut the top inch off it, you have a look at how long it takes to grow a skin. It'll be about an hour. That's quick, eh? And the other is comfrey. And you know that comfrey has a growth stimulant because if you put it in your vegetable garden, you won't have a vegetable garden much longer because the comfrey will just take over. It grows like wildfire because it has a growth stimulant in it. And so when I first moved to the property we are on now, which was about 12 years ago, there was two plants that I planted immediately and it was aloe vera and comfrey. <laughs> I planted them all around my house. Now, we don't get snow, and I know you get snow, but it makes quite a nice pot inside. And I think everyone knows that um, it's the best for burns. But when you use it for a burn, you split the leaf open. And so now you're looking at two leaves like this. And it's a good idea to take off all those little spiky things. And then you place that straight on the wound, the gel part, with the leaf at the back. If you scrape the gel out and put the, put the gel on the burn, the edges will dry out. And when they dry out and you change your dressing, you know what happens. The, it can pull the skin off that's starting to grow. But if you leave the skin of the of the aloe in place and put that on the burn, it will not dry out. So we had a lady, um, it's actually the mother of that girl I'm talking about. She rang me about four years ago and she said, Barbara, uh, can you come to our house Saturday afternoon? A friend of ours has been badly burnt and they want her to go down to Sydney, which is seven hours away, and have a um, skin graft because she's badly burnt on the inside of her arm and also on the chest. And the doctor claims that he might have, uh, that she may never have use of that arm again. This lady had two-year-old twins and then a little boy who was about five. I said, I can be there Sunday afternoon. Meanwhile, get her to just put the, the aloe vera on skin intact. So I went there Saturday afternoon and there was about 10 people there. It's like a crowd had gathered to see what was going to happen. And the father was there and he was just frowning with his arms folded. He did not want her to be there. He wanted her to go straight to Sydney because he believed the doctor and he had fear that his wife would lose the use of her arm because he'd believed what the doctor said. Do you know what my husband says? And he says this all the time, I don't believe them. You show him a test and he says, I don't believe them. Please remember that they're not always correct. Where, you know, the, and, and the Bible says in Psalm 146 verse 3, put not your trust in princes neither in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returns unto his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob as his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven, earth, and sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth, which keepeth truth forever. This is the system that you use when you're looking at natural remedies. And I looked at the arm, the skin was falling off, and I looked right in the centre and it was down to raw flesh. And they looked at me and I said, be fine, aloe vera will fix it. 
How could I be so confident? Do you know I have great faith in God and his healing ability? And I know that Comfrey can do that because Comfrey has a growth stimulant. And God gave herbs for the service of man. And so we cut cut the, the leaves. And what we did, I used all these 10 people that were around because these leaves are slimy. And so we got the leaves and we did it like a jigsaw, like this. And we did that around her whole arm. We cut the thorns off, of course. And uh, we went round her whole arm and then I covered that with plastic wrap and then we bandaged it on. And the father was looking at me and I said, it's all right. I said, this has a growth stimulant in it and it will heal the skin. And I smiled at him and I looked him straight in the eyes. And already the comfrey not comfy, aloe, that she'd put on her chest. She already had relief there and she was smiling. She was so happy. She was so happy that there was an alternative. And I saw his arms relax and I saw him relax. And then we prayed and everyone in the room bowed their head and quite a few people put their hands on her, on her chest, on her arms. And his heart was so touched. <laughs> and we prayed that God would bless this treatment. So he left there much happier. And I said, don't touch it for 24 hours. Don't touch it. Because in that 24 hours, it will start to heal. And if you move it too much and change it, it can disrupt the healing process. After 24 hours, just put another lot of comfrey on. They had a lot of comfrey in this house. I heard from my friend that she was healing very nicely and I didn't hear again. No news is good news, usually. But I, I'd heard that she'd, that she'd healed. Three years later... I went to a chiropractor that I often go to and I was waiting outside to go in and the door opened and this lady and man came out and both of their faces just, Barbara. And she pulled up her, her, her sleeve. She said, look. Do you know, I couldn't see a mark. I, I couldn't see a mark. And the man's just beaming, just beaming, just so happy. She had full use of her arm, her skin, her flesh, everything had totally healed. But I understand in that moment there can be fear. There can be fear. And God says, come unto me, come unto me. He says in... Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come unto me, all you that labour and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We always apply that to emotional, spiritual, but you can apply that to natural healing. Have faith in this body, in its ability to heal itself. And in Galatians 6 verse 9, it says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. In other words, there's a time factor here. There's a time factor. And when one of the guys on our property is the maintenance man, he was burning off, he's an Aboriginal man, and he decided to speed things up and throw a bit of petrol on Flames licked back, burnt his legs badly, his arms, his face. He just went home and had a shower. And then someone found him in a terrible pain. So they got aloe vera and scraped the gel and put that on his legs and bound it up. And then I got a call and said, look, we're going to take Dave to hospital. You know, he's in a lot of pain and, and we think that he's gone down to raw flesh. So we take him to hospital. I said, hang on. Just, just let me have a look at it. 
and I saw immediately what had happened. The bits of gel were falling off. They weren't covering it. They were drying out. I said, quick, get me as much aloe vera as you can. And we did this same process with him. And we, we put it on. I could see some raw flesh, but you know what I knew? I know that's got a growth stimulant. And that growth stimulant will stimulate tissue. It'll stimulate skin. And that's what we did. And when I'd finished binding him up, I said, what are your pain levels now? He said, oh, six out of 10. That was pretty good. It was 10 out of 10. He said by the time he went to sleep that night, they were four or five out of 10 and he could sleep. It's a bit hard on the face, so you just open the leaf and just smear it over the face. Be all sticky, but in about a few minutes, it'll dry like a skin. And then you put another layer on. It'll be sticky, but in about five minutes it'll dry. Then you put another layer on and put a few layers on because you can't really bind it, bind it to the face. Can you see why these are the first two plants I'll put in my house? Is the comfrey and the aloe vera, they both have growth stimulants, so they can stimulate rapid healing in the body. But sometimes there's a time factor. So whenever there's sickness, there's a few things you look for. It's a very simple process that you can do. You look at the person's history because that'll tell you a lot. And then you look at symptoms because what symptoms are, symptoms are your body saying, this is where I need help. And then you look for response. And response tells you this is working or this isn't working. And if it's not working, you keep adjusting till you get some relief. It's that simple. I believe God meant each one of us to be our own doctors. Because only you know how you feel, only you know what you've been through. And only you know how your body responds or reacts. That's why I'm always saying, how did it go? How did that feel? Did that help? Did that? And you've got to listen. As I said the other night, have you ever been to a doctor that won't listen? Don't be that doctor. <laughs> See what the body says. Respond as it speaks to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, it says, Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we faint not. It says, cast not away, therefore, thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence in God. Don't cast away your confidence in this body that was designed to heal it. Cast not away, therefore, thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. Did you hear that? For ye have need of patience in that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe in the saving of the soul, but of them that believe in the healing of the body of them that believe that we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And what is that power? Remember Jesus said, I will pray the Father, he will send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth. Pray. And often when we pray, God will give an impression of which way to go. So remember what he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So that's, we, we've got all the help we need. And you've got Eden Valley Retreat here too. You've got help around the corner. So let us pray and thank God for this body and its ability to heal. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you've given us. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for the healing power of the body. And we thank you that your promise and your aim and your desire 
is that we have life and have it more abundantly. Help us to have faith in you. Help us to have faith that you have an answer for every problem and that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think in regards to healing emotionally, mentally, spiritually and physically. Thank you for hearing our prayer tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.